Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to today, today's event. Um, my name is Brent McKnight, and it's a pleasure to, to welcome you all here to this event, which is a collaboration between the Bolch Judicial Institute and the Duke Bar Association. To get us started, I'd like to briefly introduce today's speakers. Judge Richard Gurgel is a United States District Judge for the District of South Carolina. He's a double Duke, having graduated with his BA in, at, from Duke University in 1975 and his JD from Duke Law in 1979. Following his time at Duke, Judge Gurgel worked in private practice in his native Columbia, South Carolina, where he was president and partner of his own law firm. Judge Gurgel was confirmed to the bench in 2010. And this year, Judge Gurgel published his second book, which is the topic of today's event. The book is entitled Unexampled Courage, The Blinding of Sergeant Isaac Woodard and the Awakening of President Harry S. Truman and Judge Wadey's Waring. The book was well reviewed by the New York Times and the Washington Post, among others. After Judge Gurgel's presentation, he'll be joined here for a discussion with David Levy, who is the Levy Professor of Law and Judicial Studies and the Director of the Bolsh Judicial Institute here at Duke Law. So with that, I will turn it over to Judge Richard Gurgel. Thank you. Well, it's great to be uh, back at Duke. I've got to confess your facilities are somewhat superior to what we had. Uh, and everybody wants to say, you know, we, we might want to say that we had to uh, uh, walk 10 miles to school or anything. It wasn't like that. But we had and I, what passed for a student uh, lounge had an ugly uh, green um, shag carpet and uh, and extremely uncomfortable chairs. And they had told the I told Dean Levy this that they uh, also managed to sell the worst coffee known to mankind. <laughs> Uh, the law school. That's, those are my searing memories of law school. Um, since the release of my book last January, um, I have received many kind invitations to come speak, far more than I can possibly accept um, with my day job. And But there are two groups I have given priority. Uh, one are my judicial colleagues, and the second, law students. Now, the judicial colleagues, as you will hear more about this story, um, I want to uh, inspire in them the same sense of purpose and, and civic and judicial courage that Judge Waring uh, um, it, it, um, demonstrated. And um, I will say that the response I've gotten has been almost overwhelming from my colleagues. Um, for law students, um, I want to share the story for a, a, a bit of a different reason. Um, as you are um, going through this process, uh, you, um, you are acquiring skills and eventually a law license that will put you in a position to do an immense amount of good. Whether you are in big law or in a small law firm, in a prosecutor's office or in a public defender's office, wherever you land, your skills enable you to do justice. And I want uh, this story shares how different people from different walks of life committed to doing the right thing and to creating a more just society um, can do it through the law. And I feel it's just so important to share this historic moment, which I think best exemplifies that. Now, when I assumed the bench in uh, 2010, um, I arrived at the federal, Charleston Federal Courthouse with the knowledge that there had been a predecessor from 1942 to 1952 by the name of J. Waitis Waring. And he was the first of the great Southern civil rights judges. And uh, he had been uh, recognized in some, in some history, not a lot, but some uh, important works of civil rights history had noted his important early contributions. But he remained an enigma. And here was the biggest enigma, un uncertainty about him. What changed him? Here was a guy who had grown up as a patrician in Charleston, South Carolina, probably among the most, if not the most, segregated city in America at the time. His uh, ancestors had, had been slaveholders. His father, his father was a Confederate veteran, and he becomes the civil rights visionary. How, how could this happen? How did, what was the process? And as I, and I was awaiting confirmation, 
I, I wanted to know more about him. And I was going, I was sobered by the fact that I was going to his courthouse and I was going to preside in his courtroom. And I wanted to know the answer. And clearly it wasn't, that information was not available. And I began digging into it myself. And that answer to that question became unexampled courage. As the clock struck 7 p.m. on August 14, 1945, Harry S. Truman assembled the White House press corps in the Oval Office. The ebullient president standing behind his desk informed the reporters that earlier that afternoon, the Japanese government had unconditionally surrendered, bringing an end at last to World War II. The reporters spontaneously burst into applause and then raced for the door to share this historic announcement with the rest of the nation. Thousands gathered at Lafayette Square across from the White House, and soon there were calls, we want Truman, we want Truman. The president came into the north portico of the White House to make a few remarks. This is a great day for free governments in the world, Truman announced. This is the day that fascism and police government ceases in the world. The great task ahead is to restore peace and bring free government to the world. But beneath the veneer of America's grand self-image as the bastion of freedom and liberty was a stark reality. African Americans residing in the old Confederacy lived in a twilight world between slavery and freedom. They no longer had masters, but they did not enjoy the rights of a free people. Black Southerners were routinely denied the right to vote segregated physically from the dominant white society as a matter of law and relegated to the margins of American prosperity. Racial violence and lynching festered just beneath the surface, ready to explode at any moment. Now this is a picture of what was called the lynching flag. It flew outside the window of the national office of the NAACP the morning after every lynching in America. And between 1900 and 1950, there were literally thousands of lynchings. And that was a common sight in Manhattan during the first half of the 20th century. Black Americans living in other regions of the country had their own challenges. As the nearly 900,000 black veterans returned home after the end of World War II, they quickly realized that little had changed and they began demanding their rightful place in America's free government. Seen from today's perspective, the American triumph over Jim Crow segregation and disenfranchisement, disenfranchisement might seem to have been inevitable. The collapse of morally indefensible practices wholly inconsistent with the United States Constitution. But in 1945, with black Southerners almost entirely disenfranchised, White dominated southern state governments almost entire, uh, white, uh, resolutely committed to the racial status quo, and the federal government largely a passive bystander. There was no obvious path to resolving this great American dilemma. Something had to be done, but what and by whom? My book, Unexampled Courage, details the long overlooked story of the beating and blinding of Sergeant Isaac Woodard, a battlefield decorated African American soldier by the police chief of Batesburg, South Carolina, on the day of his discharge from the military and while still in his dress uniform, and the transformative impact of this incident on President Harry S. Truman and United States District Judge J. Waitis Waring of Charleston. Horrified and inspired by the injustice of this brutal event, President Truman would launch a civil rights program culminating in the ending of segregation in the armed forces of the United States. And Judge Waring would issue landmark civil rights decisions, including his great 1951 dissent in Briggs v. Elliott that would become the model for Brown versus Board of Education just three years later. Late in the afternoon of February 12, 1946, Isaac Woodard boarded a Greyhound bus in Augusta, Georgia. After discharge hours earlier from nearby Camp Gordon and was traveling to Columbia, South Carolina and then to his hometown of Winsboro, where he was to rendezvous with his wife 
after several years of separation due to the war. During one of his frequent stops along the way, Woodard approached the white bus driver and asked if he could step off the bus to relieve himself. At that time, interstate buses did not have restrooms, and Greyhound drivers were instructed to accommodate such requests. Instead, the bus driver cursed Woodard, telling him, I ain't got time to wait, and ordered him to return to his seat at the back of the bus. To the apparent astonishment of the bus driver, Woodard cursed him back and told him, talk to me like I'm talking to you. I am a man just like you. The stunned bus driver told Woodard to go ahead, but at the next stop in Batesburg, South Carolina, the bus driver, now no longer concerned with staying on schedule, departed his bus in search of a police officer to have Woodard removed from the bus and arrested. Woodard soon found himself confronted by the police chief of Batesburg, Linwood Shull, who responded to Woodard's effort to explain himself by striking him over the head with his blackjack and escorting Woodard off to the town jail. On the way, Woodard was repeatedly beaten with Shaw's blackjack, ultimately driving the end of the baton into both of Woodard's eyes. The sergeant was then thrown in a semi-conscious state in a jail cell for the night. When he awoke the next morning, he realized he could not see. Later that morning, Woodard was taken to the co town court and he was convicted of drunk and disorderly conduct. Accounts of the Woodard beating and blinding were reported in the black press and received nationwide attention when Orson Welles focused on the incident in his weekly national radio program on ABC Radio. Mass meetings were organized in black communities across the nation to protest Woodard's treatment. And a benefit concert on behalf of Sergeant Woodard in New York City headed by Joe Lewis and, featured, and featuring such luminaries as Count Basie, Cab Calloway, and Nat King Cole played to a sold-out audience of 23,000 in New York City. And that's a picture on the, uh, on the left here is, um, is Joe Lewis, then the reigning heavyweight champion of the world. It's hard to describe today the role of the heavyweight champion of the world, David. It was a very different thing. That was a major celebrity and in the center is Sergeant Woodard. Meanwhile, other black veterans returning to their homes in the rural South confronted other incidents of racial violence, including racially inspired murders. No Southern state prosecuted those involved in any of these incidents. On September 19, 1946, a delegation of civil rights leaders met with President Truman in the White House, deeply distressed by the wave of racial violence that had spread across the South. Prior to the meeting, Truman's staff advised him that despite his desire to respond to the concerns of civil rights leaders, there was little he could do as a practical matter to deal with these incidents. Criminal prosecutions by the federal government for civil rights violations in the South were fraught with problems. Most notably, all white juries deeply unsympathetic to civil rights cases. And why were juries all white? because um, journalists came from voter lists and African Americans were effectively disenfranchised. Further, Congress was under the control of powerful Southern committee chairs who were determined to block even the most modest civil rights legisl legislation, including making lynching a federal crime. And the bottom of this was a political calculation his staff uh, raised, which was the South, which was essentially for voters, all white, were very strong supporters of the New Deal and of the Roosevelt Coalition, which Truman, hoping to run for re-election in 1948, could not afford to alienate. As the meeting opened, civil rights leaders urged Truman to call Congress back into special session to address the spreading violence against black veterans. The president expressed sympathy but lamented there was little he could do because there was little public support for new civil rights legislation. Leading the group was Walter White. Now, Walter White in our picture here is, is to our right of, of President Truman. He is like forgotten today, largely forgotten, but in, he was the executive secretary of the NAACP. And in the 1930s and 40s and until his death in the mid-50s, he was the most important civil rights leader in America. 
And he was Truman's greatest supporter in the civil rights community. It was apparent to Mr. White that the president did not appreciate the gravity of the situation. White changed the discussion by sharing with Truman in detail the blinding of Isaac Woodard. As the tragic story unfolded, Truman sat riveted and became visibly agitated with the idea that a uniformed and decorated American soldier had been so cruelly treated. Abandoning the advice of his staff, Truman declared, my God, I had no idea it was as terrible as that. We have got to do something. The following day, Truman wrote his Attorney General, Tom Clark, and shared with him the story of the blinding of Isaac Woodard, noting that the police officer had deliberately put out Woodard's eyes. Truman made it clear that the time for federal action had now arrived. He further indicated he intended to appoint the first Presidential Committee on Civil Rights to propose a new agenda to address America's serious racial problems. Three business days after Truman's letter was delivered to the Attorney General, the Department of Justice announced the prosecution of Batesburg Police Chief Linwood Shaw in the Federal District Court in South Carolina for the deprivation of the civil rights of Isaac Woodard. Meanwhile, the Department of Justice prepared the necessary documents to organize the first Presidential Committee on Civil Rights. Truman charged his committee in its first meeting on January 15, 1947, to be bold and to attack the root causes of America's deep-seated racial problems. He held the Civil Rights Committee's first meeting in the Cabinet Room to emphasize its importance. In less than a year, the Truman Civil Rights Committee issued a landmark report titled To Secure These Rights, which graphically detailed America's profound racial challenges and proposed groundbreaking policies and legislation, including the ending of segregation in the armed forces of the United States. President Truman fully embraced the proposals of his Civil Rights Committee. And on July 26, 1948, in the midst of his reelection campaign, he issued Executive Order 9981, mandating the integration of America's armed forces. The successful desegregation of the military, for all practical purposes, marked the beginning of the end of Jim Crow in America. One of the most remarkable stories I uh, came across uh, in, in, in researching uh, particularly this aspect of the book, the role of Harry Truman's awakening on civil rights, was a letter written to him in, in, right after he issued the executive order from a friend in Missouri who had been in his battery in World War I. Harry Truman was a captain of a battery, World War I. This, this man was in his battery. And he wrote an old friend, a big supporter. He writes him, he says, Harry, you need to get off this civil rights uh, bit or you're going to lose the election. You're going to lose the South. And Truman wrote him back. He was a fellow named Ernie Roberts. And he was a dear Ernie, you need to know what I know. He then tells him in detail the story of the blinding of Isaac Woodard. And he concludes the letter by saying, if I lose the election over this issue, it will have been for a good cause. The Justice Department's efforts to prosecute Linwood Shaw in the Federal District Court in Columbia, South Carolina, produced in the short term a predictable result. An all-white jury acquitted the, the obviously culpable police chief after only 28 minutes of deliberations. The case was tried before United States District Judge J. Waitis Waring of Charleston, a patrician whose father was a Confederate veteran and multiple generations of ancestors were slaveholders. Prior to the trial, Judge Waring was skeptical about the federal government's prosecution of a local police officer. But his views changed when he heard the highly credible testimony of the blinded sergeant, who described his arrest and vicious beating at the hands of Chief Shull. As Shull's supporters cheered his acquittal, few noticed that Judge Waring's wife, Elizabeth, who had attended the trial, left the courtroom in tears. Judge Waring joined his wife later that evening and both were traumatized by the trial over which he had just presided. The Shull trial forced the judge and his wife to stare directly into the southern racial abyss, a view which would forever transform both of them. Waring later described the Shull trial as his personal baptism of fire, 
and his Michigan-born wife's baptism in racial prejudice. The Warings returned home after the Shaw trial, resolved to learn more about issues of race and justice, which the Warings amazingly had really given very little thought about. Here they were in this profoundly segregated city, and it had just they accepted it as sort of baked into Southern life. They wished to learn more, but these were not subjects they could discuss with their fellow white citizens. Race and justice was not something you could comfortably talk about in white society in 1946 and 1947. The Warings decided to take their own private, self-directed study on issues of race and justice. Each evening after dinner, Elizabeth would read a portion of a selected work out loud to allow the judge to rest his eyes after a day of handling his judicial duties. The couple would then discuss what they had read, often while driving around in Charleston, a favorite pastime. People have asked me, well, what did they read? Well, they read some notable books on, on race of that era. W.J. Cash, Mind of the South. It was a book written by a Southerner. He challenged the traditional view in the South of the time that slavery had been a benign institution. He described it as a deeply violent and vicious institution, and that the presence of lynching was a manifestation of the continued legacy of slavery. Judge Waring would later describe reading Cash's Mind of the South was tough medicine, but he said he was a better man for it. He and his wife then turned their attention to Gunnar Murdahl's The American Dilemma. Now that, uh, the, the American Dilemma was a study prepared, funded by the Carnegie Foundation on race in America, immediately post-war. Um, the Carnegie Foundation um, paid for over 40 scholars to participate in the study. But they wanted a Swedish, um, non-American, and Gunnar Murdahl was Swedish, to be the, the, the uh, author and principal director of this study because they thought he might have a, better, a more open perspective about these issues. The, the book was eventually, was ultimately 1,400 pages long. The Warings read every page together, out loud. And by the time they finished the book, there was no turning back. As Judge Waring's new views on race and justice emerged, George Elmore, a black businessman, filed suit in federal district court in Columbia in 1947 challenging the South Carolina Democratic Party's all-white primary. Elmore was represented by Thurgood Marshall, the 39-year-old chief counsel of the NAACP, who was already developing a reputation of almost legendary proportions as a skilled litigator and legal strategist. South Carolina political leaders were united in their determination to preserve the white primary, notwithstanding clear United States Supreme Court precedent holding white primaries unconstitutional. Judge Waring, immediately upon accepting the case, understood that any decision recognizing the right of black citizens to vote would produce intense hostility and possibly a violent public reaction. He came home and asked, he mentioned to Elizabeth, if I rule for the plaintiffs in this case, our lives will never be the same. Now a convert to the cause, Elizabeth stated, I'm with you from start to finish. Judge Waring would later describe his choice as follows. To be entirely governed by the doctrine of white supremacy or to be a federal judge and decide the law. On July 12, 1947, Judge Waring issued his decision in Elmore v. Rice, declaring the white primary unconstitutional. Waring ended his order by stating, it is time for South Carolina to rejoin the Union and to adopt the American way of conducting elections. This is advice, advice his white, fellow white South Carolinians did not seem to appreciate. The groundbreaking nature of the Elmore decision was immediately appreciated by the leadership of the NAACP. In a private note to Thurgood Marshall, William Hasty, who would later be appointed the first black federal judge in American history, stated, Thurgood, I have read the South Carolina opinion three times and I still don't believe it. In many respects, I think this is your greatest legal achievement. But the segregationists would not give up. Soon a new party rule was adopted, allowing blacks to vote in the Democratic Party primary, so long as they pledged their support 
to racial segregation. Surprise, a new lawsuit was filed. And on July 16, 1948, Judge Waring summoned all 93 members of the Democratic Party's executive committee, the most powerful men in South Carolina of that era, and ordered them to an emergency hearing in his courtroom. Waring denounced their efforts to defy his earlier ruling and explained that a federal judge faced with contempt had two choices, to impose a fine or a jail sentence. He wanted those present to know that if they violated his order again, there would be no fines. Thereafter, African Americans by the thousands began registering to vote in South Carolina. And to compare the difference in 1948 um, Democratic primary, 3,000 African Americans voted in Mississippi, 35,000 voted in South Carolina. The response of South Carolina's white supremacists was thunderous. De death threats, written and oral, were constant. A cross was burned at the re Waring's residence, and bricks were thrown through their living room window. Time magazine described Waring as the man they loved to hate, but also noted that he was proving to be a person of cool courage. If the purpose of the unprecedented vilification of Waring was intended to cower him, it did not work. Instead, he continued his study and reflection on race and justice in America and became convinced that the foundation of Jim Crow segregation, the Supreme Court's 1896 decision in Plessy v. Ferguson, was legally, historically, and morally wrong. Waring, then approaching 70 years of age and likely retirement, resolved to play a role in overturning the separate but equal doctrine. Waring developed a plan to place a school desegregation case under the docket of the United States Supreme Court, firmly convinced that a majority of the justices would overturn Plessy if the issue was directly confronted, um, directly, if they directly confronted it. He noted on his trial docket a case from Clarendon County, South Carolina, Briggs v. Elliott, which sought to equalize the facilities in the district's black and white schools, a classic Plessy claim. So what had happened in the last decade earlier than this, the NAACP very shrewdly had taken the, the, the um, separate but equal doctrine and said, okay, we're gonna have, we're gonna not fight you on separate, but you're gonna have to be equal. Because the real practice was separate and unequal. And the th strategy was the South could never really afford to be equal, and it would eventually, segregation would collapse. But Judge Waring had a deep concern about that practice. Because what it did was it, it reinforced the inequality of black citizens every time the doctrine was enforced. When, when, when the plaintiff's attorney, Thurgood Marshall, appeared in the Charleston Courthouse on November 17, 1950, which was a Friday, he was there, he was going to try this classic Plessy case on Monday, the next Monday. This was his pretrial conference. And when he arrived, the uh, court security officer said, Mr. Marshall, the judge wants to see you in his chambers. I'm sure Mr. Marshall thought, what have I done? <laughs> After being ushered into the judge's office alone, it's just the two of them, Judge Waring told Marshall, I don't want to try another separate but equal case. Bring me a frontal attack on segregation. Marshall responded, Judge, it's on our agenda. It's just not tonight. We don't think this is the case. We don't think this is the time. Waring was unpersuaded, telling Marshall, this is the case. This is the time. Marshall urged the judge to think practically, noting that any decision by him overturning Plessy v. Ferguson would be reversed on appeal by the Fourth Circuit. Waring explained that since the challenge to public school segregation contested the constitutionality of a state statute and constitution, he would request the appointment of a three-judge panel in which he would be one of the three sitting. Marshall responded, well, judge, we'll lose two to one. Waring agreed, but noted that any appeal from a three-judge panel went directly to the United States Supreme Court, bypassing the Court of Appeals, and he said, Thurgood, that's where you want to be. Waring's plan was bold, even brilliant, but conflicted with the highly successful litigation strategy of the NAACP that carefully built one legal precedent on top of another, never trying to get ahead of the Supreme Court. A few minutes after this dramatic encounter, 
Waring convened the pretrial conference in Briggs and publicly pressed Marshall and whether he was prepared to challenge the constitutionality of public school segregation. Marshall stated that he was and agreed to dismiss his present suit and refile Briggs v. Elliott as the first frontal attack on public school segregation in American history. Although Marshall agreed to dismiss his original complaint and file a new suit, he needed to obtain the consent of his clients for this really fundamental change in legal strategy. Marshall had a real concern about the safety of his clients. These were impoverished people living in this rural um, Summerton, town of Summerton, rural Clarendon County. Uh, he genuinely feared for their personal safety and knew they would suffer terrible retaliation for agreeing to sign on to this ch fundamental challenge to segregation. He sent his top assistant, Bob Carter, to Somerton to discuss this change in legal strategy. Carter told a large audience assembled at St. Mark's Church in Somerton that those agreeing to join the suit could expect to lose their jobs and suffer other forms of retaliation. Carter told them that there was no shame or embarrassment if they decided not to join the new suit. But Mr. Marshall and NAACP felt it was time now to attack segregation root and branch. An elderly gentleman in the back of the church stood up and said, we were wondering how long it would take you lawyers to figure this out. With only two exceptions, all the original Briggs plaintiffs chose to join the new suit. I'm going to take just one mention about this, this photograph. Um, South Carolina has a, a great African-American photographer by the name of Cecil Williams. He was the great documentarian of the Civil Rights Movement, mostly in the 60s and 70s. When he was 14 years old, he heard the great Thurgood Marshall was coming to Charleston. And he, he wanted to come take a picture of him. He was already uh, a photographer at 14. He still he loved photography. He persuaded a family friend to drive him from Orangeburg, his, home, his hometown, 60 miles to Charleston. And he waited at the train station in Charleston for Marshall to come off the train. He realized when he arrived, he only had one flash. David, remember the flashes? You had to have a flash. And these bulbs, you only had a limited number. He had one. And as Marshall stepped off the train, he snapped that picture. It was uh, Marshall's favorite picture of himself. And hung in his chambers in, in the Supreme Court. The newly filed Briggs case was tried in the Charleston Federal Courthouse in May 1951, before a three-judge panel, which included Judge Ware. In prior years, civil rights cases in the South were sparsely attended by members of the black community, lest they be identified as members of the NAACP or challengers to the racial status quo. But on the morning of May 28, 1951, as the sun rose in Charleston, African Americans lined up at the federal courthouse and down Broad Street as far as the eye could see, hoping to observe what many thought might be the most important case in American history. When Marshall walked into the courthouse and saw that massive crowd, he turned to his assistant, Bob Carter, who would later be a United States District Judge at the Southern District of New York, and said, Bob, it's all over. He said, what are you talking about? He said, they're not scared anymore. Uh, I shared this story with uh, Jonathan Green, who's really one of the great um, artists of the United States, uh, lives in Charleston. And he painted this picture of the opening day of the trial of Briggs v. Elliott. And there is Judge Waring in the window there, looking out. And Judge Waring had described later in life um, that scene from his office. And he said it was looking like, it looked like a breath of freedom. And that's the name of that, breath of freedom. And you'll notice I'm wearing a tie that is the image of breath of freedom. Those in attendance at the courtroom were not disappointed by the performance of Thurgood Marshall and his trial team. The trial included the testimony of Dr. Kenneth Clark, a social psychologist who had done groundbreaking research on the effects of segregation on black children using black and white dolls. The crowd was also entertained by Marshall's devastating cross-examination of the state's key witness, whose last name was ironically Pro. You couldn't make it up. Many joke that Thurgood Marshall sure loves E. Crow, and one observer referencing the state's renowned attorney, Bob Figg, stated, Mr. Figg got his law degree when he finished law school, but he just got his baccalaureate address from Thurgood Marshall. 
As Waring predicted, the majority of the panel ruled that South Carolina's laws mandating segregated schools were lawful under Plessy. But Waring, fully aware he was writing a dissent for the ages, wrote an elegant and brilliant attack on the foundations of segregation in America. He concluded by finding, quote, the um, um, segregation and education can never produce equality, and it is an evil that must be eradicated. Segregation and education adopted and practiced in the state of South Carolina must go and go now. Segregation is per se inequality, written in June 1951. Judge Waring also praised in his dissent the Briggs plaintiffs, who he, 21 brave souls, who he was fully aware had suffered severe retaliation for their participation in the case. He noted they have shown unexampled courage in bringing and presenting this cause in the face of the long established and age old way of life which the state of South Carolina has adopted and practiced and lived in since and as a result of the institution of human slavery. Waring's dissent was the first challenge to public school segregation by a federal judge since Plessy in the great Harlan dissent 55 years earlier. Some have asked, how could Judge Waring, a United States District Judge, presume to overrule an existing United States Supreme Court President, Plessy v. Ferguson? Judge Waring did not believe he was doing that. The year prior to his great dissent, the Supreme Court decided three important civil rights cases, one involving a separate but not equal law school in Texas, that's uh, Sweat v. Painter, another involving a graduate student at the University of Oklahoma, George McLaurin, who was allowed to attend the school but had to sit in a class uh, outside the classroom. Uh, this picture was an exhibit in the Supreme Court uh, record. How could you lose a case with that kind of picture, with that picture in the record? And the third involving a segregated dining cars on interstate trains, Henderson versus U.S. In all three cases, uh, the plaintiffs won by unanimous vote. But the court did not mention Plessy one time in any of the three cases. Some commentators um, observed that there was a further whittling away of the Plessy doctrine in these specific cases. But Judge Waring, reading them collectively, concluded that the cases stood for the proposition that separate could never be equal. He believed what he was stating explicitly is what he thought the Supreme Court had already stated implicitly the prior summer. In early 1952, some six months after his dissent, Waring announced his retirement as a federal judge and exhausted with his ostracism in Charleston, moved to New York City. Waring observed clo uh, closely later school desegregation cases from Virginia, Delaware, and Kansas, all which were consolidated before the United States Supreme Court um, with Briggs under the name Brown v. Board of Education. And all the other school desegregation cases involving 14 different judges, both state and federal, only Waitis Waring had concluded that public school segregation, even if the facilities were equal, violated the 14th Amendment of the United States Constitution. On May 17, 1954, the Supreme Court handed down unanimously its landmark decision in Brown v. Board of Education. The court explicitly cast aside the separate but equal doctrine and adopted the per se rule that all government mandated public school segregation was unconstitutional first advanced by Waring in the Briggs dissent. Judge Waring was always philosophical about what he called the unpleasant repercussions of his civil rights decisions. In an oral history late in life, Judge Waring observed, taking the whole thing in balance, I think I'm enormously fortunate because you don't often in life have the opportunity to do something you really think is good. I think a great stroke of fortune came down my alley. The other penalties don't amount to anything they're all set by what I think is a really important contribution to the history of our country. A little over a, a year ago, uh, as I completed Unexampled Courage, I visited the town of Batesburg and retraced the fateful path of Isaac Woodard for the bus stop where he was removed from the Greyhound bus and arrested, for the storefront around the corner where he was beaten and blinded, and to the location up the street where the town jail and court once stood. Joining me on this solemn walk was the mayor of Batesburg and the town attorney, 
both of whom had only recently heard of Woodard, the Woodard incident from me. On June 1, 2018, the town attorney filed a motion to reopen the conviction of Isaac Woodard for drunken disorderly conduct, and the town judge granted the motion overturning his unjust conviction. And several months ago, the town of Batesburg dedicated a historic marker to the blinding of Isaac Woodard, candidly telling the full story. Members of Sergeant Woodard's family traveled from New York for the ceremony, and the mayor of Batesburg publicly apologized on behalf of the town for the tragic events of that fateful evening, February 12, 1946. Unexampled courage is a story that deserves to be told with all of its pathos, its brutality, and its redemption of the American system of justice. Thank you very much. Well, what a, what a wonderful book you've written. And um, I, uh, there are other judges in the room. Judge Dever is here. And we know that you have a very large caseload, and you have a lot of important cases. And it's clear you made time to write this book. But how did you do that? Well, I, I have to, I'm not sure. You know, <laughs> you know how you, uh, I remember the first day I arrived at Duke Law School, we got assigned one case in each class. and. I sat up all night reading those cases, including Marbury versus Ma uh, Madison. And I was thinking, oh my God, this is so exhausting. I don't know if I could, three cases in one night. Then the next day they gave us six cases, right? <laughs> and then we were reading 12 and 15 and 20 cases a week. And somehow you find the time to do it because you're just, the demands of the task uh, are presented to you. You know, once I um, resolved that this story I sort of figured the story out. It had been largely unknown. And certainly the connection with both Truman and Waring um, and this, in this tragic um, blinding of Sergeant Woodard, once I put the whole story together, I said, you know, this story needs to be told. There's a great, there are many lessons here. There's lessons about judicial independence and about the rule of law and judicial courage and civic courage, Harry Truman's civic courage and standing up for what he thought was right. And I just felt compelled to do it. So when did I do it? I couldn't figure a way to do it during my work week. I was just so tired at the end of the day after hearing trying cases and hearing motions and writing orders. So I would go in on Saturday mornings, and I would, if we had a federal holiday, we have a number of federal holidays, right, Jim? We have, today is such a holiday. And I would spend the three days. And then um, when we would take a vacation, I, we went to archives. My wife was once asked, what do you remember most about the book? And she says, we did all our vacations at the Library of Congress. <laughs> so, uh, not exactly the vacation spot people would want. Uh, and, um, and, and so, you know, little by little, I spent seven years doing it. It, it wasn't something I knew I couldn't be rushed. And, you know, I know a lot of people who set about or do a book. I had no idea how to really go get this book published. And, I, you know, a lot of times authors will do like a chapter then they'll go to publishers, right? They, this is the normal practice. I didn't know that practice. And I didn't think anybody would take me seriously that I would actually write this book if I presented a chapter. So I wrote the whole book. I did the whole book. And, um, and then I had some friends who, would, who had had books published, and I got in, ended up getting a literary agent, and we presented it to uh, a number of publishing houses. There was enormous interest in it. Um, we had uh, many offers, and eventually Farrar Strauss, bid the thing that if I would not go to auction, they would, they, and I'm, you know, for our Strauss Grow is really a great publishing house, and they have published it, and have been a magnificent partner in, in, in this endeavor. So, um, I, I, you know, how you look back sometimes, you say, how did I do this? I'm not really sure how I did it. Uh, but that's sort of the pieces of it, at least. So the, the connection between uh, Judge Waring and Truman and the blinding of Sergeant Woodard is that something that had that others had put together, or is that nobody that, had really put the whole story? That was together. your that was kind of creative. Uh, yeah, and 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 there are parts of the story also that I think are pretty original. One of them is the meeting between Waring and uh, and Marshall, which fills in a gap about how all this happened. Um, I will tell you about that. I um there was an oral history by a reporter, an African American reporter by the name of Alexander Rivera, North Carolina native, by the way. 
And he was interviewed late in life at both Duke and at Chapel Hill in the Southern History Collection. And I don't, the best I can tell, no one's ever found these and, and, and pointed, but he tells in clinical detail the story of, uh, of, of this encounter with Judge Waring. He, uh, his description of it is that Marshall walked out of the room shocked, as you might understand, yeah. and he immediately tells Rivera the story. And, and uh, so um, I, I will tell you, you know, I, I was a little, had a little trepidation telling this story, which is, you know, it's ex parte communication. It's, you know, arguably unethical conduct by the judge. It's an important matter. Um, I, you know, I just said, I'm going to tell the story, how it happened. We got to, you know, this is the story. Well, good or bad, that's the story. And, um, and I was at a, ju a judge's meeting, and um, uh, Nathaniel Jones, who you probably know, was on the Sixth Circuit, uh, African-American judge, was the chief counsel of the NAACP in the 70s. And somebody said, you ought to tell um, Judge Jones about what you're working on. He might know something. You know, he's a little bit young. Oh, he'd be a little, not old enough to have been there when all this happened. Maybe he knew something so he had been the general counsel. So I sat down with Judge Jones, and I told him, I said, um, I have this account from Alexander Rivera of this um, meeting with, with uh, Marshall and Judge Waring. Have you ever heard anything about that? He says, oh, yeah, I know all about it. <laughs> I said, how do you know about it, Judge? He says, Walter White told me, which is the executive secretary who was Marshall's boss. He said, he told me the story. Well, that's pretty impressive as a source. And he says, go look at my autobiography. I reference it. I just don't get into details. So I you know, raced home, ordered it on Amazon. And there it says, Waitus Waring um, challenged Marshall and the NAACP lawyers to attack segregation root and branch. That's what he was, he just didn't tell the whole story. So I was you know, very confident it was true and it made the whole story make sense. Um, so, and, and I'll tell you another sort of discovery along the way, which was just fascinating. I'm focused on, on Waring and I focused on Truman. And then I discovered they met with each other. In December of 48, Harry Truman's just been reelected, biggest upset then in American history. And the first thing, one of the first things he does after he's reelected, he invites Waitus Waring to the White House. He sent it, he, Waitus Waring's then the most reviled man in the White South. And he's sending the, every, those people a message. He has invited Waring to the White House. And I searched around once I discovered that. And I, and I finally found an account by Waring of what happened. The meeting opens, and Truman says um, to uh, Judge Waring, uh, Judge, do you know the story of the Negro sergeant from South Carolina? And he said, Mr. President, I tried that case. That's how they opened the discussion. So amazing. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a riveting story. What happened to Sergeant Woodard? That's, a, that's a often asked. It's a really good question. Um, sergeant Woodard was... 26 going on 27 when he's blinded. Uh, he, um, uh, he was in uniform when he uh, uh, suffered this injury. But the Army had a rule that once you're discharged, you're out. So he didn't get a pension as a disabled veteran. He qualified for a mi very minor um, uh, pension as a former veteran who has since become disabled. He was literally getting $50 a month. He couldn't obviously sustain himself on that. And um, he, there was some period of, of sort of hopelessness. Um, he, he initially was sort of a civil rights celebrity. He went around the country. They did raise some money for him. They, he had that ceremony, that um, benefit concert bought him a house, so he had a home, um, but he struggled. And uh, there's this very moving letter that the Veterans Administration, I, I got it from the Veterans Administration, in which he wrote his counselor and said, it is winter and I have no money for a coat. I mean, he's really struggling. But um, he, he goes to work um, um, running a um, newsstand on 33rd Street in New York. Uh, he was living in the Bronx. And um, he ran that for a few years. We've all seen blind people run those newsstands. And in 1961, he, um, um, Congress changes the law and says, until you get home, you're disabled. He gets back pay for this period of disability. And he buys rental property with it. And he, his nephew Robert Young, who I was pictured there in the, in the photograph with the, with the historic marker, um, was was a young kid, and he would go pick up the rents for him because his uncle couldn't see, of course. And he said, "My uncle uh, 
was so frugal he'd make a nickel scream. Okay, <laughs> and he so he lived a sort of financially comfortable life. He he uh, cared for his his elderly parents. He raised two sons. Uh, he um, was beloved in his family. And um, the nephew told me he says, you know, my uncle was like really bitter for a couple of years, and then he finally said, I can't live with this hate, and he never talked about it. He answered it again. Here's one of the tragedies. He never knew about the impact he had on President Truman and on Judge Wood. Just never knew. So um, we're going to, I've had the opportunity to, to ask you many questions about the book, because we have a podcast that I know you'll all want to listen to. So this is your time uh, to ask Judge Gergel about this amazing period of time and this wonderful book that you've written. I can keep asking questions otherwise, but anybody? Let's talk about the Army a little bit. Uh, the desegregation of the Army was a huge step, and uh, but it also involved the schools on, on it, Army it, bases. And it so. did. This is a hugely important thing. Um, in the end of World War II, the Army, the military, is the most admired institution in America. And, um, uh, and Truman recognized what he was doing, the desegregation of the military, because the argument was for those who were ad advancing the cause of, of equal rights and the ending of segregation, they said, that's a, you know, that's a liberal a pipe dream. It really can't work. Well, then when you desegregate the military and no loss of efficiency in the military, which is, was the report, it suddenly turned that whole argument on its head. And here's like a really interesting sort of largely unknown fact. Um, right before the Brown decision, the Department of Defense prepared a then secret report on the effects of the desegregation of the military, because it had been completely implemented. 95% of troops lived, worked and um, operated in desegregated units. And, um, uh, the um, the report said that it had been very successful, hardly any uh, disruption, and it had been uh, it had been a complete success. A copy of that unpublished, then unpublished report was delivered to the nine justices right before Brown. So they were being told, basically, this stuff works. Desegregation works. That's again a, not a largely well known story. Yes, ma'am. Well, um, Judge Waring was kind of a, fa a figure of fascination to the national press. He was like the only judge in the South who was like issuing civil rights decisions at the time. And he sat for many interviews. And some of those interviews involved what changed you. And he, didn't, he would never be very specific about it, but he did talk about his readings and his wife reading out loud to him. And um, um, so that... I, I will tell you, putting this story together was really a challenge, um, and, um, and, and I was resolved. I had certain sources. There was an oral history that had not been gotten much attention from, done at Columbia University late in his life. It was 400 pages long. No one had really mined that. That was a lot of leads from that. Um, he gave his papers in 1951 to Howard University. How about a white Southern judge gives his papers to Howard? Why did he do it? Because he, he didn't trust white institutions. What they do with his papers? So he gave it to Howard. Howard has very carefully cataloged it. The wearings were pack rats, and there's a lot in there, and I was opening boxes no one had ever opened. Um, I, um, I chased um, a lot of information. Um, I knew, for instance, that the story of, um, of Isaac Woodard, uh, that there was a lot to the story, and um, uh, but uh, I was, um, a lot of things didn't make sense about what happened at the trial. It was a disastrous trial. The Department of Justice did a terrible job. And um, I knew as a federal judge that every, every uh, case is investigated by the FBI and, uh, or some other federal law enforcement agency, every criminal prosecution, and that there's a prosecution file. And I set about to chase down those files, and sure enough, they were still in effect. They were still in existence of the National Archives. They revealed really interesting things, mostly about the um, efforts of the, of the FBI to undermine the prosecution of the white police officer. 
very interesting. Um, that was original information. I, um, I got his medical records, which were really a crucial part of re-putting this case together about how he was blinded. That's, uh, you know, how did it actually happen? The police officer said Woodard attacked him, and he hit him one time. Oh, my God, I didn't mean to blind him. I'm so sorry. Well, Woodard said the guy beat the hell out of him and then stabbed him in both eyes. Um, I mean, so I ended up um, talking to a forensic pathologist um, who told me that um, if I could get the medical record, she could probably reconstruct how it happened, particularly she wanted any x-rays of the face. And, um, and um, I'd had a, our U.S. attorney had told me, anytime I can ever help you, you let me know. He'd heard me give a talk like this. I called him up. I said, okay, here's your chance. I need help from the Veterans Administration to run down a 70-year-old medical record, and they're going to tell me if I write them, it doesn't exist. He got me on the phone with the general counsel of the VA, and lo and behold, they, they called me and they said, the good news and bad news. The bad news is the medical record has long ago been, uh, been destroyed as part of re normal record retention, but he applied for disability, and we have his disability file, and all his medical records are in the disability file. So I had that. That was enormously important in reconstructing uh, that part of the story. The Truman Library was fabulous. They were, they, they, uh, there's not been enough done on Truman and civil rights, and they were enthusiastic about helping me find things, and they have a couple longstanding archivists there who chased down all kinds of documents that were really valuable. Um, so, um, and then, you know, the technology, um, the ability to word search news articles. There's, you know, he was, there, there must have been literally thousands of articles written on Wade and Swearing at the time. Some in the black press, some in the national press, some in the southern press. I could push, put Wade and Swearing, fortunately it's, an, it's a, you know, a little bit unusual name, unlike Smith or Jones. And literally this list of articles is available to me through, uh, uh, what is it, uh, um, it's not Westlaw, but it's a, it's a, I don't know why I'm blanking on what it is. It's a, it's a software, and I, I was able to locate all these articles. I printed them all out, and there was a lot pieced together, a lot of detail. So um, it's like a lot of things you'll do when you, if you try cases. You've got to chase all the little details, and what, sometimes you, you, you hit a dry well, and every once in a while you find gold. You know? So you, you didn't mention, well, we have time for one more. Is there one more? Yeah, okay, there is. Well, that's a very interesting question. Judge Waring family was very socially prominent uh, in Charleston. Uh, he became a pariah, and um, his nephew was the editor of the newspaper. Judge Waring, as a younger man before he went on the bench, was the lawyer for the newspaper. His brother had been the editor before his nephew. And they, it was the Post and Charleston Post and Courier, one of the most viciously racist pro-segregationist papers in America. And so his nephew would travel around the country um, giving these, these sort of southern defense against his uncle. So it is sort of, they were embarrassed. One relative told me he was told by his grandmother, um, you are a cousin of Waitus Waring, you need not admit that to anyone. Uh, the current generation of the family, um, uh, the current is immensely proud of Judge Waring and have been very supportive of folks who are my age and their children um, who are adults um, have been very strong supporters. And I, I will tell you uh, one of the more current developments uh, in this whole thing about honoring Judge Waring. He was a, when I arrived in Charleston in 2010, he was a lost figure. Just like no one in Batesburg remembered the blinding of Isaac Woodard. Let me take that back. Nobody white remembered the blinding of Isaac Waring. Black folks remembered it, okay? White folks did not. Um, Judge Waring was, was gone to history. Nobody knew about this legacy and this remarkable uh, courage. Um, I, we had a conference in 2011, um, a continuing legal education program called J. Wade is Waring and the Descent that Changed America. And the Charleston Bar in full came out. We had lawyers from all over the state come, but Charleston in full came out. 
and some law and um, uh, some lawyers came to me and said, we are embarrassed that we have not honored Judge Waring, and we want to erect a statue of him. Would you let us put it on the federal courthouse grounds? And I said, well, folks, have y'all priced what it costs to do a life-size statue? They said, yeah, it costs about $150,000. They raised it. Post and Courier gave $10,000 to foundation, and my colleague David Norton said, reparations. <laughs> <laughs> um, at, uh, at that conference in 2011, um, Ernest Fritz Hollings, our retired United States Senator, served 30 years in the Senate, was the governor before then, um, attended. He's there. He comes up to me, and, and our courthouse was named for him. It was the Fritz the Ernest F. Hollings Judicial Center. He came up to me that day, and he says, we need to change the name of the courthouse. I said, what are you talking about? He says, we should need to name it for Judge Waring. He said, I had always intended to do that. And one day, I came into the office, and I was told the night before a bill had passed the Senate naming a lake in the upstate to Strom Thurmond. Thurmond had done this and named the courthouse for me. It was already done. And for 30 years, we'd had the Ernest F. Hollings courthouse. And he says, I want you to help me get it changed to the J. Waitis Waring Judicial Center. I said, Fritz, we're honored. We're going to find ways to honor Judge Waring. We don't want to take your name off our courthouse. Well, he persisted. I would see him frequently. I, I was very close to Senator Hollings. We just lost Senator Hollings this year. I was very close with him. He had been a big supporter of my nomination. And, um, and each time he would see me, he would say, what are we doing about changing the name of the courthouse? You know how sometimes elderly people will keep telling you, asking you the same question over and over again. So I went to uh, Mike Duffy, who was my colleague, who had been his law partner. And I said, Michael, I'm embarrassed Senator Hollings keeps asking me what I'm going to do, and I'm not doing anything. He says, let me tell you a strategy. Well, here's what we do. He's, he's talking to me about it, too. What we're going to do is, um, next time he asks you, you ask him to write you a letter. He won't write you a letter. And then, every time he asks you, you keep telling him to write you a letter. So, next time he did it, I did just what Judge Duffy said I should do. Three days later, a two-page single-space letter you got arrived. your letter. Okay. <laughs> about all the reasons they had to do it. And eventually, Fritz went to Lindsey Graham and said, Gurgle and Duffy won't help me. I want to change the name of the courthouse. Senator Graham called me. I said, he's been talking about it for five years. And in, um, uh, I guess it was 2016, the courthouse was named, changed name by Congress to the J. Waitis Waring Judicial Center. Thank you, Judge Gurgle. Yeah. That is great. Uh, do we have the book out there? Do we would talk the book. If anybody if anybody would like to get the book, I'm glad to personally inscribe them. They're out they're out, out front there. Right. So we'll just go on. And I'll go out there and I'll sign any books. Good. Thank you.